The man you're looking at is either one of the greatest masterminds of all time, or absolutely clinically insane. From surviving one of the most chaotic time periods in history, to ignoring death entirely, to completely manufacturing people's lives. Kenjaku wanted nothing more than to push the absolute limits of human potential. Kenjaku was on a mission that will destroy everything around him in record time, and he will happily watch the world burn to see that happen. The world that Kenjaku wants to create is one with chaos, anarchy, and a kill or be killed rule. There was a time when Kenjaku was thought to be a less important figure. Now no one can ignore him if they want to survive. Because if Kenjaku was left unchecked, then everything will come to an end. But Kenjaku wasn't always moving on this grand of a scale, so what happened? Kenjaku has always had grand ambitions, but the way that he went about achieving them, and what they eventually evolved into, are drastically different than how he started out at the beginning. There's something that he saw, something he witnessed that gave him a new perspective entirely, something that made him know he had to aim at far greater heights. What he was aiming at wasn't big enough. He had to think bigger, and all of it started in the Heian era. Kenjaku's journey would have him meeting some of the strongest and most interesting people across generations of time. He would meet Uro, the head of a squad of elite assassins, Yorozu, who by herself was on par with that entire squad of trained killers, Ryu, who had the highest curse energy output in his entire era, and Kashimo, who had one of the most dangerous types of curse energy output that anyone has ever seen, all of which would play into his plans in more sinister ways than they could imagine. What Kenjaku wanted was simple. He wanted to see the absolute limits of human potential. He was born in an era where conflict, war, murder, and violence were a natural way of life. And through that constant conflict, evolutions were born. People created new barrier techniques, curse techniques elevated to levels that no one thought was possible. Domain expansions evolved from putting out a set of rules to killing someone with no way to avoid the attack all out of survival and a constant activation of the human fight or flight instinct, something that Kenjaku wanted to take full advantage of to see how far that could really go. But Kenjaku had a major problem. While he saw great things around him that led to this idea, he couldn't create that kind of conflict on its own. The world around him was created by a long list of factors that weren't entirely in his control. Even he himself didn't have a way of becoming the thing everyone would fear on that level, since people already existed that were even stronger than he was, and he hadn't figured out how to close that gap on his own. He knew what would cause the growth he was looking for, but not how to create those exact exact circumstances with his own two hands. What Kenjaku wanted to push to its limits was how far humans and cursed energy could really go. There was some upper limit to human potential, but he didn't know what it was. When seeing people whose lives constantly pushed them to the edge, they reached heights that many would have thought couldn't be done, but it could be done, and tapping into how was Kenjaku's main objective, especially because someone he saw with his own eyes had already done it. Ryoman Sukuna, the King of Curses, was a man so strong that he didn't even consider himself to be human anymore, and neither did anyone else around him. Sukuna reached heights so far that even some of the strongest sorcerers that ever lived had no chance of beating him while he was alive. And not only could they not beat him, they couldn't even destroy his dead body. He was a man that transcended every known limit that anyone could have possibly thought of, to the point where he wasn't even referred to by his name by those who met him when he was alive. He was addressed as the King of Curses, or the Fallen. He was worshipped and prayed to out of fear that he would end the lives of those around him at any given moment. He was looked at as a god, quite literally. He had reached the absolute peak of what the Heian Era had to offer. Sukuna was the physical embodiment of humanity's upper limit. And Kenjaku not only witnessed this firsthand, but may have even seen Sukuna at his best and thought of something that could go beyond that seemingly unreachable level. Saying that Sukuna had an impact on Kenjaku's perspective would be an understatement. Not only was he the undisputed strongest in Kenjaku's eyes, even 600 years after he died, he even refused to consider the idea of himself or anyone else fighting Sukuna personally at any point in time. As in his own eyes, Sukuna was simply too strong. Everything around him led to their era being called the Golden Age of Jujutsu Sorcery. It was like a renaissance of people getting stronger every single day, in ways that they didn't even know were possible. But Sukuna stood above all of that to the point where a fight between him and anyone else was no contest. Most importantly, Sukuna represented the entire idea of what Kenjaku wanted to bring to life with his own two hands. Once Kenjaku saw Sukuna, there wasn't any going back. 
He knew what was possible, and it was going to eat away at him unless he went after it with everything that he had. Sukuna was the peak of the Heian era, but there had to be something beyond that, and as the wheels of Kenjaku's mind began to turn, so did the hands of time. The golden age of Jujutsu sorcery was coming to an end. The Heian era was the golden age of Jujutsu sorcery, but with it coming to its end, the explosive growth and the conditions that created that growth would go along with it. All of these powerful fighters would die, and while some of their techniques would be passed on to the next generation, many of their secrets would go along with them, wiping much of the progress made in the golden age completely out of history. Normally this would be an issue, but with how advanced he had become, losing to something like time was not something that Kenjaku would accept. But the biggest question was, how? The world that Kenjaku was immersed in was coming to an end, but that didn't mean that he wouldn't go as far as to create his own. If none of the sorcerers of his generation were going to reach this new peak of human potential, then he would use them to achieve that level against their will. Everything was starting to be set in motion, and where many saw their own demise, Kenjaku saw opportunity. Kenjaku had direct access to an entire group of people with the highest curse energy levels out of hundreds of years of fighting and conflict, and he knew that none of them wanted to die without pushing themselves to their limits. He went and found all of the strongest sorcerers that he knew and made them a simple promise. He would turn them into cursed objects so that they could experience life after death. The Heian era may have been coming to an end, but their end didn't have to come along with it. With none of them knowing how to do this on their own, they gladly accepted. He had secured one of the biggest pieces of exacting his future plans, but he didn't need to go the same route as everyone else. Kenjaku could get past death entirely on his own. This is where Kenjaku started hunting people down. His curse technique let him take his brain out of his body, put it in someone else's, and take them over for as long as he wanted. But he wouldn't just gain access to their appearances, he would gain access to their memories and their abilities as well. Using this, Kenjaku had a way to gain knowledge and access to places and ideas that he never had before. He started taking over the strongest and most intelligent people he could get his hands on, and through all of that time, his knowledge on Jujutsu and the world around him exploded. He took over other sorcerers, leaders of established clans, anyone that could offer him more of a grasp on what he needed to move forward and access to the tools that he would need to do so. This kept going on for more than 600 years until the Meiji period, where Kenjaku would do something that would mark him as the most vile sorcerer in human history. Kenjaku was still targeting people that stood at the top of the Jujutsu world, and eventually got his hands on the body of Noritoshi Kamo, the leader of the Kamo family, one of the most influential clans in the world. But that's not the main point of bringing up the Meiji era. There was a woman in this era that had a special genetic makeup, where she and a cursed spirit were able to bear children. This was the catalyst for Kenjaku doing one of the most depraved things that has ever been done in the hundreds of years that he had been alive. The woman was ostracized by her friends and family, and rejected. She went into the mountains with the body of her dead child, hoping to find someone who at a bare minimum could explain why she was made this way. But instead of doing anything remotely close to helping her, Kenjaku captured this woman and held her hostage forcibly impregnating her nine times in a row with nine straight abortions, with all records of anything that happened to her being destroyed, wiping any trace of anything having to do with her off of the map. After he ruined and erased any records of her life, he kept her dead children for himself, with these being his idea of the next stage of human evolution, the mixture of cursed spirits and human beings, the death paintings. So how did this turn out? Where do I begin? Kenjaku continued trading bodies for another 400 years, until he eventually ended up in modern day Japan in the late 2000s. The world had become vastly different. There were still wars that raged on, but less of it happened in broad daylight, with the majority of the fighting being done between nations and smaller affiliations. The average person wasn't seeking some reserve of untapped power, but to do the exact opposite to live a life where war and conflict didn't exist. Even the sorcerers and cursed spirits of the new era weren't even close to what the Heian era could provide. The techniques of the golden age had been forgotten, and the rapid development of stronger techniques was only being pursued by a few. While this fell in line with why he moved forward with his plans in the first place, it also presented a new opportunity. He took over a new body, Kayori Itadori, and gave birth to a vessel that could hold Sukuna a new era was approaching. He could execute his plans and no one was strong enough to stop him, except for a small few. Kenjaku kept a very close eye on his next creation, Itadori Yuji. 
The death paintings that he made by ruining and erasing someone's life were already set up for when he needed them. But this was one of the biggest pieces to Kenjaku's puzzle. Before the Heian era ended, Sukuna found a way to divide his soul into 20 pieces. Whoever ate these fragments of Sukuna, given that they could handle him, would be able to host Sukuna inside of their body. It would essentially bring him back from the dead. But Yuji wasn't only important because of his value as a vessel for Sukuna. He also had some kind of hidden strength of his own. No one knows who exactly placed one of Sukuna's fingers at Yuji's high school, but with Kenjaku going to the lengths that he did to make sure Yuji was born under the exact circumstances that he was, was, makes him being the one that set all of this in motion highly likely. Yuji would then be put in a life or death situation and eat Sukuna's finger, and Kenjaku's plan to take over the new age would begin. After 1,000 straight years, it was time. But something still stood in Kenjaku's way, Tengen. Tengen is immortal, and she was undeniably one of the most important people on the planet. There were cults that moved in the shadows and worshipped her as a god. Human lives were sacrificed to merge into her on a regular basis to keep her immortality from spiraling out of control. Tengen was one of the biggest reasons that the modern era and the Heian era were completely different places, by suppressing the birth of cursed spirits with her barriers. If Tengen's immortality ever ran out of control, she would lose all consciousness and start to literally be become the world itself, and at its absolute worst, Tengen would become an enemy to all humanity. Because of this, every 500 years, someone with specific DNA would be tasked with erasing their own lives to merge with Tengen and stop existing so that she didn't evolve into something that would threaten the entire planet. But something so chaotic that it could threaten the entire world was exactly what Kenjaku wanted, and Tengen became target number one. This wasn't the first time that Kenjaku and Tengen had met. In fact, they had met long before Kenjaku made it all the way to the late 2000s. Kenjaku tried to go after Tengen several times, but he had a major problem that he had to deal with. Tengen was tied by fate to something called the Six Eyes, one of the strongest abilities that Jujutsu Kaisen had, that happened to attach itself to one of the strongest clans of all time. Every time someone would be sent to merge with Tengen, the Six Eyes would show up and make sure that the merger happened, stopping Tengen from spiraling out of control and threatening all of humanity at the same time. Kenjaku would actively try to stop this process, but beating the Six Eyes is something that he never figured out how to do, even after he had been alive for hundreds of years and took in the memories of some of the strongest and smartest people on the planet. He even killed one of the Six Eyes users when they were an infant, and somehow the Six Eyes came back and still beat him when the merger between Tengen and one of his sacrifices was ready to happen. The Six Eyes were the biggest problem in Kenjaku's plan and now they were back and on someone that was stronger than ever. Dealing with Tengen was essential, but for now, he had to wait. So Kenjaku made other alliances. At this point, Kenjaku had already taken over the body of Suguru Geto, a special grade curse user that had the power to capture and control curses. The disaster curses were all special grades, meaning they were some of the strongest curses on the planet. All of the disaster curses wanted to bring about a new age of cursed spirits, where they would become the new humans. They thought that because they were born from human negativity, that they represented true human emotions. And as a result, they should be the ones to reign supreme on the earth. Kenjaku and the Disaster Curses ran wild. Mahito, the leader of the Disaster Curses, was fighting left and right, taking out anyone that he ran into and fighting the strongest opponents he could find. He enjoyed torturing people with his curse technique, Idol Transfiguration. Jogo ran headfirst into Gojo, the strongest man alive, and literally got his head taken off of his body. He lived, but still gruesome. Hanami and Kenjaku's henchmen invaded Jujutsu High to steal all of Sukuna's fingers that were being held onto by Jujutsu's elders, and though they sustained damage, they won. Sukuna's fingers and the death paintings that Kenjaku made hundreds of years ago were now theirs. Everything had changed. Kenjaku didn't just have a team of strong cursed spirits by his side, he also didn't have an army of strong sorcerers that could oppose him either. There weren't as many strong fighters like Sukuna, or anyone even remotely close to that, who could oppose him if things got out of hand. There was one man that had to be dealt with at all costs, but it was a vastly different amount compared to before. Kenjaku had gone from looking for a way to move forward with his plans of forcing human evolution, to actively pushing himself and those around him closer and closer 
closer to that exact end goal. Everything that the disaster curses wanted fit into the bigger picture of what he was after. Kenjaku was already starting to see a small inkling of the forced evolution that he wanted to push to its limits for so long. Mahito and the disaster curses were forcing that kind of growth out of everyone around them because the threat of death was always around the corner. And Yuji, who he specifically created to be a part of this grand plan, was making more progress in these exact circumstances than anybody else. Everything was coming into motion, and all he needed was to move the two biggest pieces on the board, Satoru Gojo and Ryoman Sukuna. And that is exactly what he aimed at next. On October 31st, 2018 in Shibuya, Kenjaku would unleash one of the most devastating attacks on Japan that the modern era had ever seen. There were attacks on a bigger scale in the past, like the Night Parade of 100 Demons, where thousands of curses were summoned across multiple cities. But the consequences of Shibuya hit much harder. Over his time swapping through bodies, Kenjaku gained control of Prison Realm, a cursed object that could seal anyone in a place void of time as long as they were held in place for one minute inside of the target's mind. The six eyes that stood in his way for so long were now isolated in Shibuya under the pretense that he was fighting to protect the people of Japan. The body that Kenjaku took over, Suguru Geto, was Gojo's former best friend that Gojo killed with his own hands. After Gojo was forced into a long drawn out fight with the disaster curses where they more or less ran away from him for 20 minutes, he was ready to be sealed. Kenjaku used the shock of Gojo seeing his best friend that he killed with his own hands, living, breathing, and leading the attack on Shibuya, flooding three years of his memories into his mind, meeting Prison Realm's number one requirement. Gojo had been sealed, the six eyes were out of the way, Kenjaku had won, but there was still something much bigger to do. Kenjaku had been trying to get rid of the Six Eyes for hundreds of years, and that was finally a real thing. He had beaten time and traveled across 1,000 years of war and conflict. He gained the knowledge of a sea of important people by taking over their bodies. The strongest of the current generation that would have contested him was no longer an issue, but it didn't give him what he was looking for. Somewhere along the line, Kenjaku had failed. There was something that he hadn't overcome in all of this time, himself. Kenjaku went through 1,000 years of development to get closer to creating his own ideals, but the products of his ambitions hadn't met his expectations. The death paintings, a fusion between human beings and cursed spirits, weren't this unstoppable force that he had envisioned. They weren't even as strong as he was. Yuji wasn't some untamable monster either. He was developing, but it wasn't at that stand above everything kind of level. None of his creations that he had gone through hundreds of years of effort to create were the answer to what he wanted the most. As he said himself, what he can create doesn't exceed the bounds of his own potential. Kenjaku's creations were inhibited by his own limits. To reach and exceed the peak of human potential, what he had to do was create something that not even he could control with his own hands. Kenjaku made a massive shift in his goals. He was no longer focused on creating something that would bring about the turmoil that he was looking for. He had to cause that kind of problem and allow it to grow to a point where it could even consume him at a moment's notice. This brings him back to the one he's been trying to get rid of this entire time, Tengen. Except now his aim for Tengen was greater than it was when he challenged her in the past. Tengen's evolution had been stopped 11 years prior by a man named Toji, and she was already starting to evolve into a curse that was fusing with the entire world, making her a perfect target for Kenjaku's newest curse technique, Curse Spirit Manipulation. Kenjaku now planned on capturing Tengen and merging her with the entire country of Japan, where malice would spill into the hearts and minds of 100 million people at the exact same time time, creating a cursed spirit with the combined negativity of roughly 1.2% of the entire world, something that would consume everything in its path, with no way to put it under control. The time to take Tengen was now. By the end of the Shibuya arc, everything surrounding Kenjaku had changed. Jogo and Hanami were killed by Gojo and Sukuna. Choso left Kenjaku completely and sided with Yuji, and Eiso and Kachizu had already been killed. Kenjaku needed to move to the final stage of his big plan, 
starting the Cullen Games. At the end of the Shibuya arc, he absorbed Mahito and extracted his curse technique, which gave him the ability to change people's souls. Around the time that Yuji ate Sukuna's finger, Kenjaku had already marked people across Japan for this exact reason. Taking over Mahito was a chess move that he had planned from the very beginning, that he used to activate curse techniques and curse energy in an entire army of people that had no idea what was happening. He was ready to pull out one of his best cards, reviving all of the strongest fighters that he met throughout history that he turned into cursed objects. Uro, Ryu, Yorozu, and Kashimo were all coming back. The Golden Age was starting for a second time in a row. The biggest problem out of all of this is that Yuji and the others started winning. Kashimo only came back because he wanted to fight Sukuna, so he didn't use everything he had against Akari, and he lost. Yuta Kotsu beat Uro, Druv, Ryu, and Kurushi, and took down entire colonies by himself. Yuji beat one of the modern day sorcerers that Kenjaku had awakened, and Megami Fushiguro beat Reggie Star, who had been brought back from the past as well. All of the major players that Kenjaku invested in had been beaten, and not only that, all of their points were given to Yuji and the others, to make rules that would undermine and bring an end to the culling games. For the people that were opposing Kenjaku, everything was going far too smoothly. Kenjaku's biggest card needed to be played, going after Tengen. Kenjaku now had a list of things to consider. Tengen's barrier is hidden within 1,000 doors that are constantly shifting to hide where Tengen actually is. All of this is made by a barrier that Tengen herself made to conceal her location. In addition, Tengen's main body was also rejecting everything that comes into the Tomb of the Star where she was located, as she had been anticipating Kenjaku coming after her from the very beginning, due to him attempting to stop Tengen's merger with a star plasma vessel in the past, since that would cause Tengen to lose all of her humanity. For the last 1,000 in years, Kenjaku has had to wait and bide his time before attacking Tengen again because of the Six Eyes constantly stopping his plans. But now all of that waiting was coming to an end. And with Kenjaku being one of the strongest barrier users of all time and having cursed spirit manipulation, he was one of the few people on the planet that could track down Tengen without question and absorb her on the spot. And that is exactly what Kenjaku planned to do. The entire purpose of the Culling Games was to divide Japan into colonies as a part of a ritual to merge everyone with Tengen. Even the sorcerers that Kenjaku brought back from the past were a part of this entire plan from the beginning, whether they knew it or not. They only existed at that point to be sacrificed to create this monster that Kenjaku envisioned. To take it a step further, Kenjaku manipulated the United States government into invading the Culling Games with over 800 troops from the United States military to wipe out the Jujutsu sorcerers. Under the pretense that they could monopolize curse energy as this fuel to power the entire country for a lifetime. When people die, they release large amounts of curse energy, although non-Japanese like the American soldiers are usually an exception. But Kenjaku specifically sent them in at night so that they would be attacked by cursed spirits, and at the moment of their death, their brains would shift in a way that let them release curse energy into the colonies for Tengen's barrier. All of this would play a role in bringing Kenjaku one step closer to merging all of Japan with Tengen to finish his grand plan and fulfill his lifelong ambition. Using the Cullen Games to merge everyone with Tengen would spread unimaginable chaos across the entire country and create the monstrosity that Kenjaku envisioned as something that was completely out of his control, which he told Choso he would make and watch the world burn purely out of his own curiosity. The peak of human potential that Kenjaku envisioned wasn't human at all, but rather a massive collection of the potential of 100 million people poured into one cursed spirit all at the same time and all of the pawns that he gathered over time were working towards that plan whether they wanted to or not. Even the people that were actively working to stop him, which included his own sons. The one thing that was coming out of the culling games was clear. Everything that Kenjaku had done for the last 1000 years was leading to the exact moment that he wanted from the very beginning. All of the knowledge that Kenjaku collected by constantly switching bodies and exposing himself to different forms of jujutsu gave him the knowledge and ability to create a plan on this level and execute it seamlessly. Making binding vows with sorcerers from the Heian era all the way up to present day gave him strong enough 
players to bring into the culling games to force out enough cursed energy to satisfy the barrier's requirements by killing the players around them, which was incentivized by the rules of the culling games themselves. Yuji swallowing Sukuna's finger served as the beginning of a new age, with Sukuna being the first of those incarnated from the Heian era to walk into the new world, with the death paintings that Kenjaku made in the Meiji period serving as the catalyst for Yuji's growth, who would then participate in the culling games to push the cursed energy inside of the barriers even further, along with the cursed spirits that he collected with Suguru's cursed spirit manipulation being used to attack the United States military to complete the cursed energy requirement for Sendai and Tokyo Colony. And with Gojo taken out of the picture in Shibuya, the Six Eyes were no longer in the way of Kenjaku's plans. Now he had to take out Tengen's bodyguards, special grade sorcerer Yuki Sukumo, and his own creation, the death painting, Choso. Choso was more than willing to fight Kenjaku, even if it would lead directly to his own death. The entire way that he had been born has infuriated him the entire time that he's been alive. Kenjaku kidnapping and violating his mother, and then pitting his brothers against each other, was something that Choso refused to let go unchecked. Although Kenjaku was far too strong for Choso to deal with, the gap between them was too clear. Kenjaku beat Choso very clearly, but that wasn't the end of what he needed to do. There was still the special grade sorcerer, Yuki Sukumo. Yuki's curse technique let her add so much virtual mass to her body that she could defy concepts and break logic completely, even turning into a black hole that could have destroyed the entire world. But Kenjaku's curse technique that he took from Kayori Itadori let him use anti-gravity to stop Yuki's self-destructing black hole and survive. Kenjaku had won. Kenjaku dusted off his wounds and mocked Tengen, satisfied that he had finally beaten her after hundreds of years of struggling telling Tengen, you've atoned for your tedious existence. Goodbye, friend. Then he absorbed Tengen with his curse technique and took control of everything that Tengen had to offer. Not only had Kenjaku succeeded, but Yuji and the others had catastrophically failed. Kenjaku now held in his hands the power to cause enough chaos to wipe out everyone on the planet at any given point in time. With Tengen under his control and the Cullen Games underway, he could begin the merger between Tengen and Japan whenever he wanted. Reggie Star once said to Megami Fushiguro that once the Cullen Game had served its purpose, Kenjaku would drop a bomb. That bomb was now one step closer to being complete. Yuji and the others have been racing to stop Kenjaku since the culling game started, as Yuji was fully willing to end himself for the chance to free Gojo. Megami wanted nothing more than to save his sister Sumiki, who had been wrapped in the culling games from the beginning, and Kenjaku wanted to watch the world's destruction because it piqued his interest. All of these stories tie together to bring us what's happening right now. Megami failed to save Sumiki because she was taken over by the Heian era sorcerer, Yorozu, and killed by Sukuna after he took over Megami's body. And Yuji, despite being willing to go to any lengths, wasn't able to free Gojo before things spiraled out of control. Yet everything that Kenjaku wanted was coming to fruition as time went on. His ultimate goal was starting to complete. When Kenjaku's mission first started, he questioned the upper limits of human potential. There had to be even more that could be accomplished, even more than what had been done by Sukuna. And now that he's gone through 1,000 years of planning and action, he finally has the answer in the palm of his hand. With Tengen as one of his curses, he can take the potential of 100 million people by force and use it to create the ultimate terror in Jujutsu Kaisen, the strongest cursed spirit to ever exist. None of the sorcerers that are with Yuji have proven themselves to be on that level. Even Sukuna and those from the Heian era may not be able to compete with Kenjaku's ultimate creation. After following through on what he wanted to do, due to Kenjaku's actions, the stakes of Jujutsu Kaisen had dramatically been raised. Now that Kenjaku has Tengen, he's ready to bring the Culling Games to an end. By summoning Kogain, he adds a rule to the Culling Games to prevent the entry of any new players, which Kogain rejected as it would interfere with the Culling Games continuation, which is being prevented by rule number 7. But Kenjaku threatens to destroy the entire barrier that holds the Culling Games together and end them himself if Kogain doesn't comply forcing Kogain to add the rule that he requested. Because with Kogain's main intention being to keep the culling games going for as long as possible, it would rather keep Kenjaku's requested rule than have him end the culling games immediately with his own hands. Kenjaku then adds another rule where once he and Megami, who's now being controlled by Sukuna, are the last ones alive, the culling games will end completely, starting the merger with Tengen. The beginning of the end is approaching, as Kenjaku is ready to start a full-scale war.
Kenjaku initially had a small group of curses that he was using to further his plans. He had to move in the shadows to preserve his identity to not be outed as Suguru Geto, and risk ruining all of the hard work that he spent hundreds of years to put into place. Now that he's sealed Gojo and Shibuya and captured Tengen, he can move freely to hunt down all the remaining sorcerers with the rest of the cards that he has in his hands, along with Sukuna now having a body of his own. Kenjaku was on a completely different level than he was at the beginning of the series, and when he destroys Tengen's barriers that have been suppressing the birth of cursed spirits, curses will be born across Japan at a rapid rate. Something far worse than the Heian era is on its way, and it will all show up at the exact same time. Tengen's barriers have been suppressing the birth of cursed spirits and boosting the effectiveness of barrier techniques across Japan. This was mainly done by four major barriers set across the country. The Hida Holy Mountain Barrier, the Tomb of the Star, another in Kyoto, and a final barrier at Kenjaku's location. Yet Kenjaku is strong enough to where he can destroy Tengen's barriers at any point in time, showing that he may be an even better barrier user than Tengen at this point in his career. As Yuji and the others all gather to think of ways to defeat Sukuna, the threat of Kenjaku is growing by the minute. With Yuji no longer hosting Sukuna, he's ready to do absolutely anything to take him down even if it means becoming a vessel once again, saying to beat Sukuna, he'll eat anything. Sukuna is now strong enough to wipe out almost anyone that stands in his way, and with Yuji and the others all gathering to fight against him, Kenjaku was planning on starting a merger that could wipe out everyone at the same time. Absolute chaos is set to begin at any given moment, but the question at this point is when will the bomb drop? 